I've spent the last nine years testing every YouTube video editing technique I can get my hands on. AKA, I currently have a double degree in getting people to watch videos all the way to the end and staying the inside. And so I wanna reveal 18 of the most impactful editing techniques I've discovered that'll help you 100X your retention. Whatever that means, it just sounded good in the title. Anyway, I've broken this video into three sections that'll help you edit videos that will be more popular than a pizza at a weight loss convention. So let's start with the beginner stuff. This video is sponsored by InVideo AI, where you can generate published ready videos with text prompts. More on this later. Most YouTubers you watch, they can just go on five, 10, 15, 20 minutes talking knowledgeably or charismatic about whatever the hell they talk about. But the truth is a lot of them can't string a sentence together to save their life. At the very least, when you're recording videos, there will probably be filler words like um, ah, uh, and introductions to sentences that probably don't need any introduction. So as an editor, your responsibility is to get rid of those filler words, those small pauses, or those introductory bits that don't need to be there. I know that sounds super basic, but this is one of these things that everyone knows to do, but most people don't put enough effort into it. Cut that stuff out and trick people into thinking you have more than 11 brain cells. But if we move on to the next tip, you're actually gonna be cutting out a lot more than just pauses and filler words. Pulse sections of your video could be considered a filler. An exercise I would sometimes do with my students is I would tell them to make their videos double the length of what they already were, but by actually making double the amount of content. So let's say they did tips and tricks videos. Instead of making a top 10 tips and tricks video, I would get them to make a top 20 tips and tricks video. And then what we'd do after they made the video, I would say, okay, get rid of like 50% of the content. And they would be forced to pick only the best moments to include in their video. And usually the stuff they ended up cutting was stuff that they thought was good, but in reality, they should have cut it anyway. So there's a simple rule you can follow here, if there's a piece of content you can cut out of your video and it's not going to negatively affect your viewer's experience of the video, get rid of it. Now that's not saying you should cut everything. If there's a story you have about something you're doing that builds up tension and improves the viewer's experience of that video, like don't cut that out and just jump straight to the conclusion. So now I've removed all the pauses, retakes and filler. Sometimes we run into an issue. It's kind of like that time someone took a bunch of photos of you. And then when you looked at the photos, you realize that the photo where you look the best in is actually the one where you have your eyes closed. And so you go home and because you're a narcissistic bastard and you try to manually edit the photo and open your own eyes and it ends up looking something like this. Not a good look. And sometimes the same thing happens in video editing. When you're going through and cutting out all of the content that shouldn't be there, sometimes your cuts are too harsh and noticeable to the viewers. And the problem with that is even if the cut was necessary, if it's too harsh, viewers will notice it and they'll spend more time thinking about I wonder what content they cut out of the video than they do actually paying attention to your video. So you want to disguise all of your cuts and here are some really simple ways to do that. First, audio. Usually try to add some sort of fade effect so there isn't that weird like audio popping sound when you transition between clips. Next, often you can do what's called a zoom cut where instead of just doing a straight jump cut so you go from one clip to another one you do a zoom in on the cut which makes it less noticeable the other thing you can do is a j or l cut which kind of looks like this you're going to unlink your video and audio track you're going to drag your video track back like this and drag the other clip forward like this and then join them together in this sort of l shape or the reverse of that would be where you join it together in a sort of J shape and it kind of looks like this. And I know it seems kind of weird on the editing timeline, but especially for talking head videos, these cuts often feel less harsh than a straight jump cut. And all in all, they help you look like you're actually a good public speaker when in reality you suck at now we will get into some more advanced tips soon that will help your attention go through the roof and help you get more views. But if you really now these first few tips I just showed you, your video edits should be flowing about as smoothly as kebab sauce as it runs all over your new jeans. But something is still off. Visually, your video is about as captivating as doing taxes. But we need to add some visual stuff to engage people's eyeballs. And one of the simplest rules you can follow here is just to show something on screen that visualizes the main things you're talking about in your video. So for example, if you're recording a Minecraft Let's Play video with your buddies, and bragging about all the diamonds you got, overlay those diamonds on the screen as you say it. If you're talking about the structure of your clickbaity watch time YouTube education video, that's actually good, don't, don't leave the video yet. <laughs> and you can use some sort of animation or screen like this to visually show that structure. Or if you're sharing a story about how you overcame your crippling fear of limp handshakes, show B-roll of a limp handshake on screen as you say limp handshake. So these are some examples and in general, there are five main things you can show on screen to keep your viewers visually stimulated and hooked into your video. So the easiest and most cheesy cliche way is stock footage. You can go to a website like Pixels and when you mention some sort of key element in your video, skateboarding, surfing, sitting at a computer, whatever it is, find stock footage that visually illustrates that thing and show it on screen for a few seconds. 
But the problem is everyone out there, including me, uses Paxels because we're all tight asses. And so when you're using the same B-roll as approximately infinity other YouTubers, sometimes it feels a bit generic. So you can take that to the next level and use a site with a paid subscription to get access to more premium B-roll. If you're gonna do this, they do sponsor me, but I think InVideo is quite good. Now InVideo is typically used for generating faceless, published worthy videos with relevant stock, subtitles, and music using AI text prompts. But also as a feature that I think you can use to automatically find premium, relevant, and stock footage for your videos in bulk. So you just select script to video, paste in your transcript, adjust your settings and hit continue. And then InVideo is gonna generate a string of stock footage perfectly tailored to the content of your video. You can make any adjustments you want with text prompts or you can hit edit and manually adjust certain clips. And when you're happy, you just export this video and then drag it into your editing timeline. And now whenever you feel like your video could use some variety, you just cut between your video clips and your main footage. And beyond the features I've already mentioned, InVideo also also lets you do things like add captions automatically, generate AI voiceovers, even ones that sound like your real voice. Ever seen a platypus? It's like nature's mashup of a duck and a beaver. And even translate your voice into multiple languages just using text prompts. Again, I am sponsored by them, but as you can see, depending on the type of content you make, InVideo could save some of you guys tens of hours of work. So if you want to check them out and learn more, link is down below. Now, if you do value uniqueness, often you can get your own B-roll, which would involve you actually filming B-roll or screen recording B-roll that you need. Another thing you can do is to use custom animations to visualize major topics topics within your video, which can look really cool and work really well, but takes a lot of time to do. So there's that trade off. And last but not least, I don't see many people do this, but I really like to do this and it helps my retention a lot is sometimes you can use a whiteboard and visually draw certain concepts that you might be talking about. It's way faster than animating and looks less professional, but it still seems to keep people hooked. And if you're lazy like me, it might be a good idea. But moving on to the next tip. See, the other day I was watching a movie and I encountered a big problem. And that was that all the actors speak in dramatic and intimidating voices like this and somehow all of the other people in the rooms they're speaking in can hear exactly what they're saying but me the viewer of that movie for the life of me cannot hear what he's bloody saying and so like 85% of other Netflix users, I turned on captions, just like you saw there. But subtitles aren't just useful for people who can't hear what's going on in your video. Often subtitles in and of themselves add a new element of visual stimulation because while the viewer is listening to the audio content within your video, their eyes are also occupied reading the subtitles. Now you don't wanna do this too much. Too much subtitling can often steal from your video. People might be too busy reading the subtitles to actually see what's going on. Or also if you're just subtitling your entire video, sometimes you're get acclimatized to it and it can lose its engaging effect. So usually I would just recommend using them one when viewers can't clearly hear what is being said. Two, when you have multiple speakers and you might use colored subtitles, for example, to differentiate between those speakers. Or three, to emphasize main events or key points that you really wanna ram home. Next thing I wanna talk about is actually improving your footage itself. So let's take a look at these two clips here. One looks like it was filmed by a Hollywood director the other one looks like it was filmed by my dad on his stupid Sony camcorder that he continues to use even though a smartphone is so much better. But the truth is these two clips were filmed with the exact same lighting, exact same camera. The only difference is the color grading. Now granted these differences are more extreme because they were filmed in what's called log footage. But I think the point still stands and that is color grading can really level up your video without you actually needing to change your recording setup too much. Now color grading is incredibly advanced but there are four main things you can do that will take your footage to the next level. First one is fix your white balance. Basically what you're doing is helping your footage know what color is actually white. And so if you've ever filmed footage that looks a little bit too warm and too orangey or a little bit too blue and cold, it's probably because you haven't set your white balance properly. Next is adjusting the exposure and contrast. You wanna adjust these so the brights are bright and the darks are dark, but don't do it so much that your whites become pure white or your blacks become pure dark because then you start looking like something out of a satanic movie. Next, you wanna specifically adjust your skin tones. Often you wanna add a bit more color, increase the brightness slightly. And lastly, you can use a color wheel to choose a color and slightly change the mood of your video. Now this is something that most of us don't realize when watching a video, but once it's pointed out, for example, if you look at a movie like The Matrix, you can clearly see that they're exaggerating the greens. There's a clear green tint with everything. And you can use this color grading to specifically set moods for your video. For example, more orangey colors might make your video feel more warm and homely, whereas cooler colors might make your video feel more professional. And all of these steps are a lot of work, don't get me wrong. But once you've found the look you like, 
You wanna save that as a preset or a LUT. And then every time you edit a video, you just wanna take that preset and slap it on like your Will Smith and your footage is Chris Rock. And there you have it, better looking footage without actually spending lots of money on more fancy equipment. Now, before I talk about the next tip, I want you to think about the retention graph from one of your last videos. And if you don't know what the retention graph from one of your last videos look like, slap yourself on the wrist right now. I'm very disappointed in you. But anyway, for those of you who do know what your retention graphs look like, you probably have noticed a really big drop off in the beginning. Most people aren't gonna watch your video all the way to the end. The only time 100% of people are watching your video is at second one, and then that quickly drops off. Then usually most videos will lose between 25 and 45% of their viewers before the curve flattens out somewhat. So we put more effort into that front bit and try to make the best first impression we can and hook them into watching the rest of our video. And so what you should do in these first 30 seconds is to take every viral Subway Surfer clip and every popular Family Guy episode, overlay it all on top of your footage, and you'll get 100% retention, guaranteed. No, but actually you do wanna make the beginning of your video quite visually stimulating, put more effort into it than the rest of your video. But I know it's easy for me to say that, so let me give you some general tips that usually apply to most people here. And these ones can be fun because they take advantage of most people's human instincts. So let's think back to our ancestors who are living in the jungles. In order to survive, they need to be aware of every slight out of place movement. Because it could be like a poisonous snake or worse, a rogue Jehovah's Witness trying to tell them about their Lord and Savior. And because us humans are so finely tuned to these little movements, we can often take advantage of this to subtly stimulate and make the exact same footage more interesting. So there are four little movement tricks you can use. One is a pan where you slowly move from one side of the screen to the other. And you can also add a slight zoom. So not only is the footage panning, but it's zooming at the same time. And sometimes that can add an even cooler effect, especially if there's sort of like a goal or a specific thing that you're progressing to at the end of that pan. Another thing you can do is just a very slow zoom in or zoom out. This is pretty popular in talking head videos where you might notice in this video, for example, often the screen is slow zooming in on my big head rather than just being static. Now, another thing you can do is add a fake camera shake. This sort of mimics the slight movement that would come if someone was holding a camera and filming you. And often that slight movement makes the video feel just a bit more fluid and engaging. And the next thing you can do is use a punch in or scale in or scale outs like the ones you just saw on screen and then screen tilts sync up with the cadence of the footage. Now you can only do this at certain moments in your video without it feeling weird, but adding all of these to your repertoire and switching between them rather than just using the same sort of zoom effect for the entire video can make your footage feel less predictable. And again, when something is less predictable, viewers will want to watch for longer. Now you will have to get a feel for when to use these or not, but some rough guidelines are, if you're making a strong punchy statement, a fast punch in and then maybe a tilt can often work best. Then when your tone becomes more relaxed or you're providing content, that's when a slow zoom out, zoom in or pan often feels most natural. Now the next tip is using multiple camera angles, even if it's the exact same topic can often make your video more engaging. You'll notice when watching TV, for example, it's rare that they'll stay on the same camera angle for more than say, seven seconds. But I hear you in the comments sections being like, but Marcus, this is a video editing video. How am I supposed to add more camera angles when the video has already been shot? You're right, this is a video editing video, but there's something we can do here. If you take a look at Graham Stefan, something really smart he did is when he punches in on some of his clips, he flips the camera horizontally in his editing studio. So it makes it look like he has two different cameras and two different angles, when in reality, it's the exact same camera angle. So I think that's a cool trick to finish off our beginner tips with. Now, into some of the more intermediate tips, because you can add a bunch of visual movement and make your video visually stimulating and it can still not emotionally connect with your viewers. And one of the easiest cheat codes for hooking your viewers is humor. Hello, how are you? And you'll notice advertisers do this nowadays when they're trying to sell you something. Often they'll try and make their ad funny because they know that you know they're trying to sell you something, but if they can make you laugh, then for some reason you don't mind and you're all good with that. Now again, this is a video editing video. Doesn't adding humor need to come before editing the video? Well, no, not necessarily. Firstly, if there are already jokes within your footage, you can emphasize those jokes with your editing. One classic example is stopping the music for dramatic effect around the punchline, for example. So when that punchline hits them, it's more impactful. And another thing you can lean on, although you want to be really careful not to overdo this, is funny sound effects. But while all of this can help make your video more engaging and get you more views, sometimes like eating chili, it does add flavor, but if you do too much of it, you and your plumber are going to regret it later. More sound effects and B-roll and memes does not always equal better, which leads us to our next tip. Now, as a very general rule of thumb, more stimulating videos tend to do better than less stimulating videos. Because while adding in extra stimulation to your video usually increases your attention, there's a reason why Mr. Beast still has very highly fast paced videos. It's not the only way to go about creating content 
or at the very least, you don't necessarily want to be super fast paced, engaging, retention-y the entire video because viewers need a break sometimes. So like think of your favorite song. There's probably loud, engaging moments, quieter moments. You got the verse, you got the chorus, you got the interlude, you got the prelude, you got the solo. And each of these different sections are often different tempos. And this keeps the song fresh because if everything was the exact same tempo the whole way through the song, well, that's just called a failed cash cow YouTube channel. And we can apply this logic to YouTube. For example, if we look at Michelle's I Train to be an Olympic Boxer video, there's a moment where Michelle's been knocked down in training and she's sitting sort of dejectedly with her coach. And that quiet moment in an otherwise very intense video adds contrast. And if you hover over the play by, you can see that the lots of people still watch this. And this is called contrast editing. But moving on to our next tips, something the last few tips have focused on quite a bit is visuals. Sound design is often something we don't notice until it's gone. For example, watch this clip. Now watch it. This is obviously an exaggerated example, but notice how weird it feels without the sound. Even in little ways, if I had something slide onto the screen, it doesn't feel as good as if it slid on with a whoosh sound effect. Now we'll get more into sound design later in the video, because first I need to confess something that I stole my girlfriend's underwear. Okay, that's a lie. Stop the cow. <laughs> but did I steal your attention just then? What I just did there is called an extreme pattern interrupt. If you were starting to get bored of this video, starting to zone out, and then all of a sudden you heard that, you'd be like, what the heck? And bam, I've got you back in the video. One of my friends, Ed, does this really well. If we check out this video, for example, by throwing in a random skit or a random character like this that people aren't expecting to see in a YouTube education video, it stops you from zoning out and focuses you back in on the video because your brain's like, oh, something unexpected is going on here. Let me figure out what this is. Now, this can be tricky to do, but often the best videos have some sort of substantial pattern interrupt at least every 30 seconds to a minute. But if you can at least just get a couple of substantial pattern interrupts in your video, preferably more towards the beginning, you'll be way ahead of most content creators out there. Now for the next tip, I want to talk a little bit about shot choice. Now we could go down a massive rabbit hole here, but essentially if you're showing the same shots at the same depth throughout your entire video, kind of like this one, it's lazy and your video can start feeling a bit meh. So just vary that depth, sometimes using B-roll even. So for example, you could begin a new segment with a really close up shot and then go up to a really wide establishing shot and then go back into a more mid range normal shot. And you'll see movies do this all the time. Kind of like we just talked about with contrast editing where you want to vary the tempo and level of stimulation in your video throughout it. Having a good balance of close, medium and wide shots has the same effect, keeps viewers watching and gets you more views. Now we talked about how important emotion is and the next tip I wanted to talk about involves <laughs> And the reason the music is in the intermediate section of this video is because getting it right can actually be tricky. Many creators search best copyright free, no copyright sounds, download it from YouTube and just slap it in the background of their entire video, which is the wrong way to use music. Please stop it. Get some help. Like we talked about earlier with contrast editing, the tempo of your video should be different at different parts of your video to keep people interested. And if you're using the same song as background music for the entire thing, it fights against your contrast editing and sort of normalizes everything. So the better way to do this is to use music as a tool. If there's no need for a song to set the tone of a certain part of your video, don't use a song at that part. If using a song sets the tone better and pulls viewers into your video story more, for example, intense fight music when there's a big fight going on, emotional striving, music when you're going through a challenge or mysterious music when you're in some sort of unknown situation. What you're doing is picking specific tracks to exaggerate the emotion you want viewers to be feeling at certain points within your video. And usually those tracks shouldn't be playing for much longer than 30 seconds to a minute max. Now be careful with transitioning between different songs because if you do it too abruptly, it's kind of be gross. So often what you want to do is apply some sort of like ring out, reverb or fade down effect when you're ending a song or have the start or end of a song sync up with a really noisy moment moment in your video. So the beginning or end is sort of hidden by it. And while we're on the topic of more advanced sound design, let's talk again about sound effects. So there's a couple of different types of sound effects you can use in different situations to take your video to the next level. First, you've got ambient sound effects that can give your video more atmosphere at certain points. For example, if you're shooting in a city, you might apply background ambient city sounds. If you're out in a walk in the woods, but your mic's not capturing very much forest ambience, you can manually add some of that in. Or a great one is if you're in a spooky, sort of mysterious horror-esque situation, you'll see horror movies apply really specific type of ambience to get viewers on the edge of their seats. Now the other type of sound effects you have are folly sounds. These are basically sound effects that will exaggerate key moments within your video. So for example, if you slap someone, you can overlay a slap sound effect to emphasize or exaggerate the impact. If there's an explosion that happens in your video, overlaying some explosion sound effects to, to exaggerate that explosion will make it hit harder. You get the idea. Now let's move on to some of the advanced strategies. So if you remember right back to the beginning of the video, we talked about cutting out pauses and disguising those cuts a bit to help with video flow. Something you can do to take the flow of your videos to the next level is perfectly illustrated in this Edgar Wright movie, Scott Pilgrim. Can I get back to you on that?
We look at this scene, he's on the phone with his sister, and his sister looks to the right hand side of the screen. The screen does a whip transition in the direction that his sister is looking. Then the text from the school bell is on screen. It gets followed down as the camera moves to the right and the next scene is revealed. Now this is insanely good editing, but the principle here is something we can apply to our own YouTube videos, which is to increase your flow when you're transitioning or moving objects around the screen. If you can keep everything sort of moving in the same direction, the video is going to flow better. Like if this scene had been done, but the whip pen had been to the left rather than to the right, it would have felt really weird because the direction contradicts with the eye movement, the camera movement, where the text is leading you, etc. So in your videos, especially when you're doing transitions, think about what direction the footage is sort of naturally flowing and then try to go with that rather than against it. If all of the elements in your clips are going one direction, but one of them is going the opposite, sometimes you can go into your editor and flip that clip horizontally so it starts feeling like it's going in the same direction as everything else. And the next thing I want to talk about kind of aligns with that, which is guiding your viewer's eyes. Your video is a little world your viewers have been transported into and there are different points within your video that people can focus on. And you wanna make sure that your viewer's eyes are resting exactly where you want them to be resting at all times. Now, sometimes that's easy. For example, if there's a talking head video, usually people are looking at your eyes, but sometimes what you need people to look at might be a bit less obvious. So you can do things like use a visual aid, use an arrow, a circle, a highlight, an underscore to really emphasize where your viewer's eyes should be. You can manipulate the screen itself. You can zoom right in on something or you can cut something out and scale it up. Or you can even use lighting and your viewer's eyes will usually first be directed to the lightest thing on the screen. And the next thing I wanna show you is kind of interesting that relates to this. When you're guiding your viewer's eyes and being aware of where it is on the screen they're actually looking during key moments of your video, try to keep those things aligned and on the same plane. For example, if I go back here and you do a punch in on me, that punch in probably felt a little bit weird. Now let's do that one again. And it probably felt a bit better that time. The reason for that is on the first weird feeling punch in, when I punched in, my eyes were in a different spot and they weren't aligned with the same position on the screen they were when it was punched out. And so when I just change the framing a bit to make sure that the key things you're gonna be focusing on, so my eyes are as aligned as they can be across all these different scenes, it feels less awkward. Your viewers don't have to recalibrate what they're looking at to stay focused on the thing you want them to stay focused on, which usually helps them stay on the video for longer and helps you get more views. But speaking of getting more views, if you implement everything you learned in this video, your retention is gonna be better than probably 95 to 98% of YouTubers out there, and that's not an exaggeration. Unfortunately, there's more to succeeding on YouTube than just creating high retaining videos, as anyone who's posted a great video that doesn't get any views has probably found out. So if you've ever found yourself in that situation, check out the video on screen. I'm gonna go through a process that will help you get a hell of a lot more views. And now that the quality of your videos is going to be on the next level, it's the perfect video for you to watch next. I'll see you there.